courgette plants are producing flowers now so we've got some things to do here the first of those things i think is going to be to drop this netting down to half its height okay there we go so that will still provide a little bit of protection from the wind but it will give the leaves better access to sunlight and it will give pollinators better access to the flowers now we've got two types of flowers on these plants this is a female flower you can see the embryo fruit behind it this is a male flower you can see it's just got a stalk i'll, get, I'll see if we've got one that's a bit clearer so that's probably a male flower the cucurbits tend to produce male flowers first that's a male flower there that's finished flowering so this female flower here needs to be pollinated to set fruit. That may well happen naturally by the action of various insects that are around here, but just to make sure, I've got a soft paintbrush. I'm just gonna go in and get some pollen from this male flower here on a different plant. See there's a bit of pollen on the end of that brush. And I'm gonna transfer that pollen into this flower. There we go. And hopefully that will result in a good fruit set here and our first courgette. Meanwhile, there is something we can do with these male flowers and I suppose that's gonna be the first harvest from this vegetable garden. So we've got the male courgette flowers here. Got some lovely chickweed, which was growing in the corner of the rhubarb patch here. I've got a bit of bittercress, another common garden weed, but very edible. And I think what I'm gonna do is pinch out some of the tops of these broad beans, which will stop them growing higher and get them to focus their energy on producing beans. But it will also give me some edible shoots because the tops of broad bean plants are edible. So I'm just gonna take that much off the top of some of these broad bean plants. We are stopping it producing more flowers. You can see there's more flower buds in there, but you need to kind of limit it so that the plant can focus on filling out the bean pods that are already pollinated now. So got my fresh picked vegetables, both wild and domesticated, chickweed, broad bean tops, courgette flowers, and bittercress. Over the way, I've got some bacon frying. And once that bacon gets going, I'm just gonna throw in a bit of diced onion. Meanwhile, over here, I've washed this chickweed. I didn't put it in the colander because it was covered in dirt. It was covered in grit. Bittercress, did I say chickweed? I meant bittercress. Bittercress doesn't really deserve the name bitter. It just tastes like cress, watercress or, you know, the mustard and cress that you grow on your windowsill. It doesn't really deserve the term bitter. And then I'll taste a little bit. I mean, it has a bitterness to it, but so does regular cress. Right, chickweed. I will give this a rinse as well, because even though it's lovely and fresh and it looks really clean, there might be some little bits of sand or grit on there. Normally it would be a lot more obvious that it needed washing. Uh, we've not had a lot of rain here recently, so there's no soil splash on here and I've been watering this plant so I could pick it. So we've actually got some really clean chickweed here. It probably didn't need a wash, but since I've been watering with my bin juice fertilizer, I thought it's probably best to rinse that off. If we'd had some rain, chickweed always picks up loads of soil splash and little bits of sand and grit, but it's not so bad at the moment. Okay, so chickweed in. Broad bean shoots, I'm not even going to wash at all because they were right at the top of the plant and I don't want to introduce too much water to this mixture. So just going to cut those up as well. Now you will sometimes find that inside the buds of these, inside the sort of folded flowers and buds of these broad bean shoots, the black fly have already got in there. I did check a little bit for that. It doesn't seem to be a problem here, but I'm not actually all that worried if I eat one or two aphids. They're just extra protein. So that's my green mix. Bit of dressing on there, that would be not a bad little salad. Onions and bacon. I 
I've got some cheese. This is a piece of uh, mature Gruyere. And that will go rather nicely with some green leaves and bacon and onion. Now I'm just going to give that a quick blast in the microwave just for 30 seconds, just to wilt down those leaves a tiny bit, make this a bit easier to handle. That was probably actually about 20 seconds, but it's just wilted down those leaves a tiny bit. And that will make it easier to use this as a stuffing inside those courgette flowers. Tiny bit of salt, it won't need much because the bacon's salty. Good crack of pepper in there. And I think a little bit of nutmeg because nutmeg and green leaves and cheese is a good combination. That'll do for that bit. Now we're going to make a batter. So about a tablespoonful of flour, one egg, and a bit of milk. I'm using gold top here, which is practically cream. A little bit more flour. Yeah, it's a bit more like it. We'll have a little bit of seasoning in the batter. I'm going to fry these in butter and olive oil. So this bit, stuffing the courgette flowers, is where it all gets a bit messy. But I'm just going to put a spoonful of that mixture inside the flour, like that, and then kind of press it down, gather up the petals, like that. Okay, so I've got a little package of stuffing. That's going to go in the batter. And try not to let go of that end. And it goes. Right, camera off, because I need to get focused on this. All right, the fresher flowers are easier to stuff than the slightly wilted ones. And I've got loads of stuffing left over. So straight out onto a piece of kitchen paper towel. Now, you know I don't like waste, so that stuffing and batter it's all going to get mixed together. And we're making, I suppose, a bit like pakora, except not spiced the same way. Okay, and that lot can just go in there like that. In little clumps. All right, while that's cooking, let me just go and burn my tongue on one of these fried courgette flowers. So as they've cooled, the batter has gone a little bit soft, but that's normal. Fried stuffed courgette flour. That's really good. It's really delicious. So I just had to go and turn the fritters. But yeah, these are superb, absolutely superb. The balance of flavors in here is amazing. Earthiness of the chickweed. The little bit of peppery fire from the bittercress. The broad bean tops are a bit like kind of pea pod flavour. The courgette flowers themselves are fairly neutral. The bacon and cheese just gives it the right lift. Really good. Now in case you're wondering why I'm not sharing these with Jenny. Jenny's away at the moment unfortunately dealing with a family emergency. She'll be back before the time you're watching this I hope. Okay and these are the fritters without the courgette flowers and the dominant aroma here is the earthiness of the chickweed all right now again probably going to burn my tongue here this is essentially the same thing but just the filling really and the batter without the courgette flowers also really good for all of the same reasons so there we go it's the 7th of june that was the first proper harvest from our vegetable patch garden fritters and stuffed courgette flowers a couple of months ago i planted a honeyberry here on this is the slope that links the downstairs garden to the upstairs garden is eventually going to be steps we're going to put some steps in here it's a slope at the moment anyway i planted a honeyberry it's uh, right about there and it's doing okay a honeyberry is a kind of fruiting honeysuckle it has these blue long berries on it which are edible supposedly tastes like blueberries i don't know i've never tried them just beyond that actually just down there is a thornless gooseberry 
I'm planning to put fruit plants all the way up the side of this slope here so we're going to have like a fruiting hedge of all different slightly unusual perhaps plants. Now the thing with honeyberries they do have male and female flowers on each plant I think they're also called hascaps by the way they do have male and female flowers on each plant but they're not self fertile so you need a pollination partner so I've bought another honeyberry here different variety because you have to kind of pollinate it with a different variety so that one in the ground there already is honeybee this one is boreal beauty I'm going to plant this one not too far away from that one not so close that they actually merge but close enough that the pollinators can go between the two plants so this is my planting hole here and I've dug it deep enough that the whole pot will be accommodated in there plus a little bit of extra radius so that I can put some better compost in here because the soil here is a little bit on the poor side so I'm going to feed it and give the plant a really good chance to get started it's going to break up because there's a kind of hard pan at the bottom of that hole so I might just get the fork in there and break that up that's it now I thought what I'd do here for a bit of kind of long-term feeding for this plant that's going to go into this hole rather than using compost I'm gonna I've got a bunch of feathers here courtesy of the rooks you can hear cawing in the background and I'm just going to chop them up into the bottom of that hole. I think there's a pigeon feather or two in there as well. Just cut a bunch of feathers up. In case you can hear rumblings of traffic in the background, it's silage season and the farm trucks are going up and down the road full of cut grass to make silage. Right, so a bunch of feathers in there, and these feathers will break down very, very slowly in the soil, and they'll provide mainly nitrogen, but also phosphorus and calcium for the, uh, the plant as it grows. Those will actually take several years to break down completely, but over that time, as they break down really slowly by bacterial action in the soil, they will feed this plant. So, I've got a decent root ball, and I'm just going to, oh, there's a cane in now, I'll take that out. Just going to open that up. It's very dry, so I'm going to give this a really good water once we've got it in the hole. So, down in there like that, and then we'll backfill with some of the soil that came out. Kind of heal it in. And what I'll do also, because this is on a slope, there's quite a steep slope here, I'm going to build a little kind of berm around there of soil. So just a little bank there, so that when I water this, the water won't just run straight down the hill. Alright, so now good watering in, and as you can see, there's a kind of little almost like a little pond around it so the water won't just run straight down the hill it collects there and then soaks in in the right place so over the next days and weeks I will continue watering this give it a really good soaking in let it get its roots down into the soil once it's established it won't need watering at all So there we go, that's honeyberry uh, boreal beauty and honeyberry honeybee. Close enough that they will pollinate each other, also with enough space that they've got some room to grow into proper bushes, but eventually they'll probably merge into a bit of a hedge here. But hopefully the pollinators won't have any trouble finding their way between these two plants and cross-pollinating the two varieties for me. We won't see any results until next year now because flowering season is over, flowering and fruiting season is over for these plants. They flower in about kind of April-ish and then fruit in about June, July. And there are no fruits on this one because it didn't get pollinated. So uh, shame, but it's putting on, putting on some good growth there. And I'm hoping this, this one will do the same and there'll be nice big bushes for next year when we we'll get some flowers and hopefully some fruit to taste. Here, however, on the thornless gooseberry, we've got some flowers and tiny, tiny little embryo fruits. So. With a bit of luck, we'll have some 
sort of a crop off of this this year. I've unfortunately snapped off a few little twigs of this while I was working in here, but it'll just bush out anyway. But yeah, we have a few little fruits here and there on this plant. So we might get to taste one or two of the gooseberries this year. I thought we might have a quick roundup of the volunteers in this garden. That is the plants that came up from seeds that just fell where they, where they lay and grew. So in this border here, there used to be a compost bin here and we've got volunteer squash, probably butternut squash, that have just come up in the middle of this border. And I'm gonna leave them. There's not much else that we've planted here, so I'm gonna leave them and see what happens. We might get one or two squashes off of this. At the back, those are opium poppies or bread seed poppies. And I'll talk more about those in a minute because we've got some more of those at the top. Over here, we have volunteer wheat. So I reckon the rooks in the oak tree have probably dropped a stalk of straw that probably that had one little wheat grain still in it, and that's grown. I think this is just one plant. But I thought I'd leave this and see what happens because if we get some wheat from that, I might save the seeds and then grow that next year. And then of course it'll multiply by however many grains there are in the head there. And we might have enough wheat to make a loaf of bread or something. So here in the upstairs garden, there is a, a volunteer bronze mustard. That just grew itself, but that's something that people plant as a salad or as a mustard greens for steaming. That's, uh, I didn't plant that, but that's just growing itself. I'm gonna leave it be. Another opium poppy. Now, it never kind of ceases to amaze me or kind of confound me that opium poppies, bread seed poppies, the, the poppies that we put on the top of bread are the same species as this very pretty garden flower that's grown quite commonly as a decorative garden flower. And also it's the same species from which opium is extracted, which is a controlled substance. Isn't that interesting? It's really weird. So there's another one of those here, just about to burst into bloom. And then in here, alongside the rhubarb, we've got volunteer tomatoes, volunteer potatoes, and somewhere, yeah, another volunteer squash down there. So again, we'll leave those and see what happens. The tomatoes here, you can see they're already flowering. They might do something, we ne never know. The potatoes, well, that's a flower on the potatoes. So the potatoes are probably just about ready to lift now. So we should have some free potatoes. There's another volunteer potato there and another one there. So that's the roundup of volunteers in the garden. I quite like the kind of potluck aspect of this. You probably can't see very much in this footage right at the moment. Uh, there's a reason for that. I am out, it's half past 10 at night on the 12th of June. I'm looking for glow worms. It's not even completely dark yet, but I'm trying to give myself the greatest chance of finding them by coming out early. I'm going to come out every night until I find one. There's a reason why I'm not using a torch to find my way. Partly because I want to preserve my night vision, but also because glowworms are disrupted by any kind of artificial light. So I've actually come to a place where there is very little artificial light, which is what makes me hopeful that I will see some. I am seeing actually bats in the sky. Let's see if we can catch a bat on camera. I think that must be the planet Venus up there. I did see bats, and unfortunately, they're not going to perform for the camera. I'm trying to walk extra softly here because, from past experience, I found that glowworms are very, very timid. They will hear you approaching, turn off the lights, and disappear down into the undergrowth. So, I'm taking it nice and slow. Walking on crunchy gravel, so there's a limit to how much I can mitigate my footsteps, but try not to stomp around too much. I've also run up the GoPro camera I'm using a couple of minutes in advance 
so that the screens have turned off and the camera's just recording without emitting any light itself. The backlight on the screen is actually quite bright at night and I fear that that would make a difference to our results. Right, so we're coming now to the bit where I've seen the most of the juvenile glowworms. This is where I think I probably have the greatest chance of seeing one of the adults if I'm here at the right time. Nothing in evidence so far. But I think I'm probably just a bit early in the season. So plenty of chance to come and do this again until we get lucky. I'll keep the camera rolling because well, if we do see one it's likely to be a very fleeting glimpse. And so I'll keep the camera rolling in case I miss it by while I'm waiting for it to spin up. Now as I understand it and from memory the female glowworms are actually quite bright. The light they emit is as bright as a standard LED or something. It's almost bright enough to read by if you had one in a jar or something. The males produce a much dimmer light which they only employ at close quarters when they're close to a female that's signalled for them. Oh, there's a big moth there. Big white moth. Doubt you better see on the camera. But no glow ones today. So that was the 12th of June at about 22.30. So it's been a really hot day today actually, so I was hopeful. But it's still early in the season, so We'll come out on the, on the warm evenings and have another go. This is the first courgette from the garden which I picked yesterday. I think it's the 13th of June today. So this is the first proper harvest. I know a previous segment we said the first real harvest was the flowers and a few other bits and pieces, but this is the first kind of intentionally grown thing. I'm going to try and do this justice today with a recipe that's kind of inspired by ratatouille and aubergine, parmesan and a bunch of other things. So all I'm going to do here is just slice vegetables really thin, layer them in a dish together with this tomato and red pepper sauce that I made in a big batch. This has come out of the freezer actually. So this was tomatoes, red peppers, onions, oregano, olive oil, salt. So we'll begin with just a thin layer of that sauce. And this is really just to stop it from sticking. Nice firm courgette. I might try just using the mandolin section of my grater. Let's see how well that works. Yeah, seems to be okay. I was tempted to do the kind of Disney ratatouille, the Pixar ratatouille, where I would arrange slices of this alternate with aubergine in the dish. That's already been done. Want to see a good video on that? Binging with Babish. Okay, that's good. And then the courgette's gonna have some cheese on top. So this layer is just gonna be cheddar on the courgettes. And then I've got some Grana Padano that I can use for the other layers. Now, next layer, aubergine. I'm gonna try and cut wafer thin slices. Too big to go through the mandolin. And for this, we're going to have some Grana Padano, which I'll put through the slightly finer grater. Okay, and then more aubergine, more sauce. I think with formalized versions of this dish, I think there's a formal kind of procedure for getting the layers right. I'm not following anything like that. I'm just doing what I think seems right. Okay, well, 
bottom one. Yeah, it's got to be on that middle one because the bottom one it hits the rim. Top one you can't get on there. Okay, another layer of courgette. And I'll try and make the top layer pretty because that's the one we'll see when the dish is baked. Obviously this is not a homegrown aubergine. I have got aubergines in the greenhouse, but they're not fruiting yet. And then a bit more of the cheddar cheese. And now for the top layer, I'll try it to get some really nice neat slices of courgette. Okay, right, imperfect slices just anywhere first. And then the neat slices on top. Don't know if you can hear my stomach rumbling. All these bits won't go to waste. I'll make another little dish that's not perhaps quite so pretty as this one, if indeed that's what that is. A bit more of the Grana Padano cheese on top. Some little blobs of sauce, just, just dots of sauce on there. More cheese. Okay, so that's got to go in the oven now for probably half an hour. It's a tiny little dish to go in the oven all on its own, but I've got some bread proving across the way, and I'm going to make another dish of this, which is going to go in the freezer. Okay, yeah, so the version when nobody's watching is a bit more like this. Sauce, aubergine. Now, I would normally fry aubergine in oil just to give it a bit more flavour and to soften it a bit, but this is going to have a long bake in this sauce. Cheese. Courgette and aubergine, kind of mixed together because that's what we've got left. Last bit of sauce. And then some larger slices of aubergine, like that. Now these are, can be a little bit thicker because they're going to be on top. And I'm going to brush them with a bit of oil, which will make them kind of almost fry as they bake. Bit of olive oil on there and some tasty cheese on top. And of course the oil will come out of the cheese into the aubergine as well. So that will actually help that as well. So those two in the oven now, together with the bread, I've got proving over the way. So I'll make your best use of the oven space. All right, bread is looking good. And those two dishes, I would say, are done. Got to obviously leave that to cool down a little bit before we attempt to taste that. Something, something vegetable napalm. What we're really waiting for is for this bread to cool down because if I try and cut that while it's still steaming hot, it will just tear apart. The crumb needs to just firm up a little bit and set before I try and cut it. But just listen to this bread. Right, time for a spot of lunch. Let's see what this bread's like first. Now, I remember somebody telling me once, you should never cut bread rolls with a knife. You should tear them with your hands. Now, I don't know where that idea came from, but yeah, that looks like nice bread. This is my sourdough starter. And it smells amazing. And my courgette parmigiana, if you want to call it that, I suppose. Is it right to call this parmigiana? Someone will probably object if I call it that, but someone else will object if I don't mention that. Well. It's all nicely cooked and tender. Let's have a little taste. A mm, little bit more seasoning. Now, I mean, how could I be tasting a difference between this courgette and the ones I buy in the shops when it's got all the cheese and tomato and everything else on it? How could I be tasting a difference? Except, I don't think I am imagining that. That courgette tastes much more prominently of courgette than the ones I buy in the shops. Tell me it's my imagination. I can taste the freshness. I can definitely taste 
a difference in a kind of green freshness. Yep, so I'm actually really happy that I've done justice to my first courgette from the garden. It might be completely psychological and I might just be perceiving that I think this tastes better. But then again, if I think this tastes better, then it does. Okay, here's today's insect friend, a beetle larva, and specifically a ladybird larva. If I'm not mistaken, a seven spot ladybird larva. I do like ladybird larvae, apart from the fact that they are helpful in the garden. They remind me of little crocodiles. Here's today's insect friend, or friends, hoverflies. I've just seen a few of them here, resting on these bindweed flowers. Well, feeding and resting on these bindweed flowers. Now, hoverflies like this, you see they're stripy, they look a bit like wasps, but these have no sting. This is defensive mimicry. So these have developed stripes to fend off predators and to discourage predators from, well, presumably to discourage predators from attacking them, even though they have no sting. Hoverflies, very beneficial in the garden. Hoverfly larvae eat lots of uh, pests like aphids. And then the adult hoverfly are pollinators. And nearly every one of these flowers down here has a hoverfly feeding and resting on it. I guess this is where they get their breakfast. Today's insect friends, you can't really see them, but they're somewhere inside of there. So this is a stinging nettle plant and it's got a caterpillar tent. So inside that covering of silk web, there are a bunch of small caterpillars. I'm not sure which species, possibly red admiral or I think there's one of several. I think peacocks do as well. Possibly one of the tortoiseshells. But there we go, so that is somewhere in there. You might be able to see them on video. There are some caterpillars feeding. And that is a caterpillar tent. And of course that protects them from being picked off by birds. When they get a bit bigger, they'll come out of there and they'll spread themselves around amongst all of these nettles and feed on them. So there's a huge patch of nettles here. And again, we can see quite a few of those caterpillar tents. I'll come back to this spot in a few weeks and that'll probably be in the next one of these videos. And we'll see if we can actually see the slightly larger grown caterpillars. At the moment, they're probably too small to see very clearly. And there we go. Caterpillar tents, that's what's causing this kind of spiderweb, which is not spiderwebs at all. It's silk from tiny caterpillars. Okay, well here we are again, hunting glowworms. Slightly more sensitive camera this time, so you might just be able to see. Well, there's the moon. There's the silhouette of a tree. You might be able to make out the outline of the path I'm walking on. But in any case, the notion is to walk along here and see if we can find a globe worm. I've been coming out kind of every couple of days since the middle of June and I haven't seen one yet. It is getting warmer, the weather's getting warmer, and the overall air temperature at night is getting warmer. So we might find something. Anyway, let's hope tonight might be the night.
Now given that glowworms, male and female glowworms, rely on their bioluminescence to find each other and to mate and communicate, and that they only do this supposedly on a few nights of the year, I feel like there must be some kind of trigger, some kind of environmental trigger, maybe the phase of the moon, maybe some kind of weather conditions or the length of the day or something like that that enables them to synchronize, enables them to all bother doing their thing at the same time. So, you know, not much point in the males being out looking for females when they're not there, not much point in the females signaling when the males aren't looking. So there probably is some environmental factor, and I don't know what it is. So we're coming up to this place here is the kind of hot spot for where I saw all of the glowworm larvae earlier in the year. I'll try and walk as softly as possible so I don't disturb them. It's not looking very hopeful that tonight is going to be the night, or indeed that there is going to be a night when I find them, but I will keep looking. Well, if I was going to see them, I would expect this to be the place. That noise, in case you can hear it, we're just walking alongside a river. So yeah, I, maybe I've got to wait till the moon goes down, or maybe there's some other thing I need to wait for. Maybe I need to wait until the air temperature is above a certain point, or humidity, or surface moisture something else. I do understand that glowworms are quite susceptible to dry conditions. So, and it's been quite a dry May and June, so this might just not be the year for them to breed. They live several years, and I think it's true that they may not breed in very dry, unsuitable years. They may just not breed at all. Well, no, it looks like we're out of luck then. So 24th of June, no glowworms in evidence. I'll turn the camera off now on the off chance that I see one on the way home. Obviously, I'll turn it back on. There is, however, on returning home, is this sound. I think there might be an owl of some kind. Doesn't sound quite like a tawny owl. If you know what that is, do let me know in the comments. We needed a hotel for an overnight stop up near Norwich and I decided to spend, I don't know, I think it was only about 20 quid more than Travel Lodge would have been. And we're staying here. This is Mangreen Country House. And it's just amazing. It's a beautiful old building, really quirky, really old fashioned. And it's just a nice hotel, actually. The room's been fantastic. The shower was great. And yeah, like I say, it was 20, about 20 quid more than a travel lodge, and it includes breakfast, of course, which I think more than makes up for the, the price. So, how about that? 
Lovely old place. And there's something interesting to show you inside as well. The, uh, this, this obviously was a, an old country house. And so there's the main staircase, which I brought you down just a moment ago. But near to our room, so this is the main hallway and staircase that you walk up to get to the rooms. Our room is through here. But yeah, as I say, outside of our room, there's this staircase. Now this staircase is what would have been down to the servants' quarters. So this is a servants' staircase. And this is the... This is the staircase for the residents and owners of the house. And this is the staircase, very steep and narrow, goes straight down to what would have been servants' living quarters and the kitchens. I'm going to take you down there. I'm probably not meant to go down here, but I'm going to have a quick, a quick nose. And it comes out in the same place. So yeah, the Mangreen Country House Hotel, we've really enjoyed our stay, only for one night, but it's been very comfortable. Facilities were great. We're looking forward to a quick breakfast in just a moment. I can thoroughly recommend this place. It's really good value as well. It's time for the comment positivity section, and this is where I'm just gonna pick out a few comments that maybe inspired me or asked an interesting question, or perhaps just made me laugh or smile. Anyway, we got quite a full docket today, so let's crack on. Uh, right, so a suggestion, this was on the berry hunt video. You could do a video on an old world meal where you only use foods that would have been available before the Colombian exchange. Maybe even things only available in England. So no potatoes, tomatoes, peppers, chocolate, vanilla, etc. That's actually a really good idea and I might well explore that. Thank you very much for that. Certainly there are a lot of good channels that have done good videos on historical recipes. I don't know if anyone's actually kind of done, let's try and create a new recipe using old world ingredients. That could be quite interesting and that's a fascinating idea. Thank you for that suggestion. This one's on the foraging using apps, i.e. don't use apps when your life is on the line. By the shape of the stems on your mystery hogweed, I have it as a common one. Not sure enough that I would touch it, but that's my reckon. Edit, I watched a still of it again, 95% sure it's common. Never seen a giant one with the stems carved like that. Still wouldn't touch it though. That is exactly what was going through my head when I saw that plant. Everything in my head was saying, this is probably common hogweed, not giant hogweed but it was just an atypical specimen to the extent that I couldn't be 100% sure. And less than 100% sure, especially when you know you're less than 100% sure, is when the alarm bells should ring. And so for me, yeah, I didn't touch that plant because even though I was 90 something percent sure it was just common hogweed, I don't believe it's a good idea to kind of court that uncertainty. Uh, this one's on a scam baiting video. This is a reference to the FAQ that was in that video which was about, do people have to be stupid to get scammed? This is also how many smart people end up getting into all sorts of weird cults. They get caught at some low point in their life and suck it into the cult's worlds. Sometimes you get blindsided by desperation. And then they go on to say, I almost fell for a scam where I got an email about some extra funds I could get hold of regarding the recent absurd electricity prices here in Sweden. I stopped when they asked for my credit card. Don't have one, only a debit card. For my part, I think it was just a bit too hopeful and they caught me at a slightly bad time. And I think that's true. I know it's really tempting to say only stupid people would fall for scams or how could you be so stupid as to fall for a scam? But I think that's a kind of defensive reaction and that's kind of like trying to reassure ourselves that we're too smart to fall for scams. And pride comes before destruction. That whole thing about I'm too smart to fall for a scam isn't gonna protect you from being scammed. And so just to elaborate on my answer here, really, I said, I think really nobody is completely smart in every possible way. It would be like being skilled at every single endeavor. And it just doesn't happen to people like that. Worse, humans are actually quite poor at judging their own competence at anything. We all have a tendency to think that we are smarter than we really are, myself included. 
our brains would like to tell us that we're brilliant. And yes, you are brilliant. Yes, you are smart. But your brain will try to tell you that you're smarter than you are. And that can sometimes leave you wide open to being attacked in, in some way that you thought you were too smart to actually fall for. Anyway, moving on. This is again from the Berry Hunt video. So somebody said, whilst it's illegal without permission to dig up orchids from the wild, could you take a sample of soil from near them? This would be a good medium for establishing their seeds as it would hopefully contain the appropriate fungus. Yeah, I think I probably can do that. So I was out walking, we found some wild orchids. It is illegal in the UK to dig up any wild plant without the landowner's permission. And in some cases, even with the landowner's permission, you still can't dig them up because if they're protected or something like that. Anyway, I would like to have orchids in my garden, in the little wildlife bank that we've created in the garden. I'm not gonna just go and dig them up out of the wild because that's illegal. I'm also a bit dubious about buying them on eBay or buying them online because I suspect they may not have been properly and responsibly sourced or grown in, you know, grown from seed. Orchids from seed are particularly difficult because the seeds are tiny and they require fungi and bacteria and other organisms to germinate. And so it's a like the kind of mycorrhizal relationship you may have heard of between a lot of common mushrooms, fungi and trees and plants. Orchids have taken that kind of one step further where the seeds can't even germinate without a fungus to help them. And the fungus almost provides the root system for the plant as it starts off. Anyway, so if you gather seeds from orchids, which you are allowed to do without digging up the plant, it may be difficult to germinate them in a new place if the fungus that they require for germination isn't present. So yeah, I think the solution is probably going to be to collect some seeds and to collect a little bit of local soil from there, just a little handful of soil, and then put those two things together into the place where I want them to grow. It still might not work, but it's worth a shot. Question on the nostalgia cooking video. Do you often find recipes a little salty for your taste, Mike? Only asking because I quite like salty food, so usually tend to add some. Yes, I would say my tolerance or my preference for salt in food is below the average. I tend to enjoy the flavours of the food itself. In fact, I have been known to buy, don't know if you can still get them, but a brand of crisps in the UK called Salt and Shake. Now Walker's Salt and Shake, but they used to be Smith's. And it's a bag of, crisp, of unseasoned crisps, potato chips, and a little blue bag of salt in there. And the idea is that you would add the salt yourself and shake the bag and, and season the crisps yourself. It's a gimmick now, but apparently that's how potato crisps used to be sold back in the day. So it's a kind of anachronism. Anyway, I have been known to buy that brand of crisps and eat them without the salt because I like the flavor of potato. And adding salt, I know salt is a flavor enhancer, but it, it does also mask some of the subtler flavors I find. So I appreciate that might be a little bit weird, but perhaps you shouldn't be too surprised about that by now. My tolerance for salt, my preference for salt is lower than the average, I would say. And so very often in videos, I'll be conscious of the fact that there's already salt in things like bacon that I might be adding, or strong cheese like mature cheddar or pecorino has got quite a bit of salt in it. Uh, also things like olives, anchovies, and of course Marmite, which I sometimes also use as a seasoning. So things like that have already got salt in them. Stock cubes is another one. So I'm often very, very conscious about the amount of salt I'm adding to a recipe because I know I can add more at the table if I want to. But I also know that if I add the amount of salt that is prescribed in the recipe, I may find it a little bit too salty for my tastes. And it is a matter of taste. There is no correct amount of salt. There is no right amount of salt to add to food. And if you like a lot of salt on your food, then, you know, as long as that's not doing you any harm, then more power to you. I tend to like things on the light side of salt so that I can enjoy the other flavors of the food, which salt sometimes just steamrolls over. Uh, a couple of things on the slow TV videos. So somebody asked, curious what your average engagement time is on this type of video. So the slow TV videos I make, which are typically not narrated, they're usually about 10 or 15 minutes long and often featuring just scenes of nature or something like that, or perhaps scenes of something happening. And they're not narrated, they are just for people to put on in the background and enjoy, or just to kind of watch without demands being made on your attention. So you can just put it on and, and enjoy it as if you're sitting in a natural scene. Not everybody kind of gets slow TV and that's fine. They are numerically amongst the least popular videos on my channel. They are the least watched, I would say. 
typically only getting about 12 to 15,000 views. Uh, so why do I make videos that are less numerically successful than some of my other content, scam baiting, uh, budget challenges and so on? Well, partly because I enjoy making them. So when I'm out there making that slow TV, I'm experiencing often the thing that's featured in it. So I'm sitting by a river listening to the water bubbling. That's good for me. And I like to share that with other people who appreciate it. But also, it's not all about the numbers, because whilst not so many people watch those videos, the people that do watch them and enjoy them really enjoy them. And you can see that from some of the comments. People say, just what I needed. I needed to relax and I just put this on and it didn't make any demands and now I feel a bit unbunched. And that's, for me, a good enough reason to keep on making these videos. I don't expect they are ever going to become the most popular videos on my channel. Don't really care. The people that like them love them and that's good enough for me. Case in point, this comment was pretty stressed out but I forced myself to just sit down and watch the whole video. Feel a lot better now. Thanks for the ducks. I'm really glad that you enjoyed that because that's why I make them. And so to answer the question, what's the average engagement time on these videos? I would say about 30% uh, of viewers are remaining at the halfway point in the videos. And usually it's fairly level after that. So I think a lot of people decide early on it's not for them and stop watching. But the people that make it a third of the way through watch to the very end typically. So it kind of, the, the graph kind of does that and then levels out and stays quite level. And I've turned off some of the ads on those videos so that they're not so obtrusive. I never use mid-roll ads anyway. So those videos also make less money than some of the other videos. But again, as I say, I don't really care because I'm doing it because people who like them really, really love them. And because I really like them as well. I really like the process of going and making those videos, finding things that I think will be relaxing to put on the screen, about composing the shot even. So that one I did recently by a river, I had to walk around a little bit and find things that I thought would be aesthetically pleasing to see on the screen. So nice old stone bridges and little bubbling brooks and weeds waving in the current and trout rising to eat mayfly and all those sorts of things. So I had to go and compose those shots and I think I got just as much out of those videos, if not more, than people who watch them and find them relaxing. So yeah, they're gonna continue even though they're not all that successful because I enjoy making them and clearly the people who do like them absolutely love them. Next question, this was on the greenhouse watering thing. Have you considered buying a 3D printer? You're very tech savvy, thank you. I don't know that I am. And projects could make good use of one. I have thought about it, actually. I have thought of getting a 3D printer um, because in any of my craft projects, which actually I haven't done a kind of build or make project where I craft something from scratch for quite a while. Maybe I should get back on that. Repeatability of small parts was always my failing. I can make a small intricate part if my project requires two of those small intricate parts, trying to make two exactly the same was very, very difficult for me. My accuracy, I suppose, in crafting is not that great. I can make something that looks okay. I can't make two things that look the same. So a 3D printer would be a great solution to that. The only thing that's kind of difficult about that is the learning curve for all of the 3D modeling stuff. I'm not sure that I have the time to commit to learning the skills, especially at this time in my life when things don't go in there and stay in there as well as they used to. Not sure if I've got the stamina for the learning curve of the 3D modeling. Maybe I should do it as a kind of low key project in the background where I just learn at my own pace rather than try and get it done for a video. Um, I might do it because 3D printers are so cheap now compared to what they used to be and they're actually very good. So yeah, it's the 3D modeling learning curve that's putting me off dipping my toe into that water. Also, I don't want to become a channel where I needed to make something, hey, I just went and 3D printed it. There is something enjoyable for me about hand crafting, even though I'm not that great at it. I don't really want to just become a channel where I solve everything with that solution. I'm not sure that I would anyway. But yeah, I thought about it, still thinking about it. <laughs> Forbidden Cider video. This was on a random stuff. Do you ever find yourself narrating when you're not recording a video? Absolutely, yes. Um, I suppose that's my, that's 
just the way things go now. That's how my brain works now. It's when I'm looking at things, even when the camera's not rolling, there's a narrative in my head. And sometimes, I, yeah, sometimes I'm saying, oh, I think I'll just, yeah, those oranges look nice. I'm going to have three of those oranges. And I very, very often will find myself narrating in the kitchen or at home in the garden, even when there's no camera anywhere nearby. I suppose it's just a habit now, having done this for, what, 15 years, pointing at things and talking in front of the camera. That is my skill set, by the way, pointing at things and talking. Yeah, I do it all the time when the camera's not rolling. I would like to hear him say khaki coloured khakis. Well, there you go, you just did. The word khaki, that is that kind of olive greeny brown colour. Some people pronounce it khaki. Some people, I don't know, might pronounce it some other way. The standard UK pronunciation is, I believe, khaki. So, like khakis. Khaki coloured khakis. Why is that not confusing that we pronounce those two things the same? Because context, it just hardly ever comes up that it could be one and it's not, it's the other. Oh, this one's on the video where I try to distill the essence of the English language using AI stuff. Can you tell me how many takes it took to read these? So I think the answer is lots. The total recorded audio was about four times as long as the edited video. So lots and lots and lots of stumbles and trips when I was reading Doot the Doodit and Doodit Doothada and Doot Doodin and Don't Do Dot Dons or whatever it was. Uh, yeah, so lots and lots of stumbles. And that's generally the case, actually, that in even my scam baiting stuff, scam baiting, again, is a challenge to read because often the English is a bit broken. And so typically the recorded audio length will be at least twice as long as the, ed at least what, typically, typically the recorded audio length pre-editing will be about twice as long at least as the final edited video. I have developed some techniques for audio editing where you can make kind of invisible cuts if you've got one sentence where you said the start of the sentence right and the other one where you said the end of the sentence right. Actually, I was going to do a little demo, but I think it's it's more or less easy enough just to describe it. If you've got to cut audio, if you've got two sentences, so one sentence where you stumbled at the beginning and another sentence where you stumbled at the end and you want to use half to a cut and shut job of the two, it's easier to cut on sibilance, so s and t sort of sounds rather than m or a. So you go through the audio until you hit an s and cut at that point, and then you go to the other bit of audio and find that same s and cut, and you'll find those things joined together because s and s just slides into each other, whereas a and a. So voiced sounds tend to cut poorly. Unvoiced fricatives and sibilants and those sort of sounds cut a lot more successfully. This is Atomic Shrimp's free audio tip of the day. If you've got to cut audio and do a cut and shut job, cut it on a T or an S or a K or one of those sort of sounds that's unvoiced. Ah, and the last one. Hey Mike, it looks like YouTube dropped your end card links. Great video, by the way. Thank you for letting me know about that. The scheduling engine on YouTube is a pain in the neck. Sometimes when I schedule a video, either the comments that my early access viewers put on there disappear or the end cards fall off. And so when I schedule a video, it becomes private until it's then published. And yeah, sometimes the end cards just disappear in that process. So I'm always grateful when somebody actually notices that and points it out for me. Thank you very much. Um, that is the one kind of correction on YouTube in the comments that I will always, always welcome. A lot of other corrections tend to get a little bit wearing after a while. But anyway, let's not talk about that. This is comment positivity. So that's it for this video. We didn't find glowworms, but we will keep looking. So maybe in the next episode, we might have some footage of actual glowworms. I live in hope. Anyway, I hope that's been interesting. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again soon.